So um, I think I should change uh, the order a little bit because uh, I didn't have time to really prepare what I wanted because I, I fell asleep. <laughs> um, so reading the two, the king's two bodies in the campaign um, is a bit demanding because we have to do close reading. So I propose that we do that uh, tomorrow at some point. And then, well, it's only a slight change in program. I want. I thought the, the best thing was perhaps uh, to talk about biology right now, um, because it will perhaps give you a more uh, well, concrete approach to what I'm talking about and why I'm interested in that, and then go back to our issues in the second part with the and and preparing tomorrow's uh, session. Okay, so. Uh, I apologize for this change in the uh, uh, order of presentation, but we'll do, we'll do the whole thing in the end. And so, I, will, I think I will call uh, this um, new chapter, uh, Epigenetics and the Plasticity of Life. I will tell you about uh, what I'm interested in. Uh, Molecules, which has a very precise, which have a very precise order, 
to the extent that they are nuclearized, that is, small molecules, and these molecules, ordered like an alphabet, you know, or not, carry the genetic information in living cells. Okay, so it, it is because they carry this information that Heidegger can compare the genetic code to cybernetic program. And it is true that for a long time, I mean, until very recently, the definition, well, the genetic code was the basic definition of the living. Uh, a living being is a program. A living being is a genetic program. So I'm here borrowing the definition of the program from the French gen genetician François Jacob in his book, The Logic of Life. It is a book uh, which came out in 1970. So in, in the English, it's page 910. François Jacob, yes. I'm sorry I didn't have time to photocopy the handout. So it has been translated into English. Uh, the Logic of Life, ou la logique du vivant. The aim of modern biology is to interpret the properties of the organism by the structure of its, con of its constituent molecules. In this sense, and so Jacob will confirm what Heidegger says, in this sense, modern biology belongs to the new age of mechanism. So it was very clear in the 70s that because of the genetic code, Modern biology was a kind of mechanism. In this sense, modern biology belongs to the new age of mechanism. The program, Jacob goes on, is a model borrowed from electronic computers. So it's very clear. It equates the genetic material of an egg with the magnetic, magnetic tape of a computer. It evokes a series of operations to be carried out, the rigidity of their sequence, and their underlying purpose. Okay? In fact, and it, he, ends, he ends like that. In fact, these two kinds of programs differ in many ways. First, first, in their properties. One can change at will, the other cannot. In a computer program, information is added or deleted according to the results obtained. The nucleic acid structure, on the contrary, is inaccessible to acquired experience and remains unchanged throughout generations. So you see, this is a very interesting quote in which Jacob says, okay, so the genetic code is a cybernetic, but it comes from cybernetics. It is comparable to what we call, what we call a hard, uh, the hard, the hard what? Hardware. Yeah, hardware, yeah. thank you, thank you. The hardware, it, it is borrowed from electronic computers, okay? Because it is a series of operations, the DNA sequence, to be carried out in the rigid se sequence with the same underlying purpose, which is information. And Jacob says, but in the case of the genetic code, it is even more hardwired than in the case of a cybernetics, cybernetic program. In a computer program, you can delete information. You can change information. You can add or delete uh, some element in the code. In the genetic, genetic code, you can't. Why? Because the nucleic structure is inaccessible to acquired experience and it remains unchanged throughout generations. So, it is rigid, which I will call non-plastic, yeah? cannot change. Genetic code has this main characteristic that it is even more rigid than a cybernetic code <coughs> because you cannot change any, anything in it. Otherwise, you have monstrosities, you produce monstrosities. So it is unchangeable, non-plastic, non-transformable throughout generations. It's pure inheritance. Okay. Why? And this is very interesting because it is inaccessible to acquire experience. It means that any kind of experience has no influence on the genetic code. It is this anti-Lamarckian uh, statement that experience doesn't change anything to 
Okay, so we are, for, for a long time, until the beginning of the 21st century, it is true that genetics is a quite deterministic science which affirm the unchangeability, the non-plasticity of the code, and which defines the living being as a code that is as, as a series of unchangeable letters. And further in the text, Jacob compares the program precisely with the text, a writing, a series of letters, but a series of letters without any possible interpretation. It is a text without interpretation. This is what, what Jacob says. This is, well, the genetic code is, the, is a non hermeneutical text. You cannot produce any interpretation of it. Okay? Because the, the letters are set in a special and unchangeable order. Okay? So, I could have taken another definition of the genetic code. You, you have a million definitions of the genetic code, but they all equate. Uh, they all amount to the same, that is this uh, rigidity and changeability of the program. It's randomness also, it is absolutely unmotivated, non-plastic, and inaccessible to experience. So, we can understand then why philosophers uh, are not ready to define the living being or their life as a program. Okay? Because for them, it is absolutely contradictory. The notion of unchangeable, non-plastic program is absolutely uh, contradictory with the idea of fragility, exposure. Everything we defined this morning with Zoe understood as killable life. There is a, a very strong discrepancy between this definition of the code and the definition of fragility or killable life. So, according to them, I think this is the main reason why they can't really take biology into account, because for them, biology is another kind of mechanistic science and, and is not um, able to provide us with a satisfactory definition of the living, because we want to define what the material life is, and <coughs> instead of having a material life, we have a machine. Okay? And we'll see, um, in, in a moment we'll talk about Derrida's reflection on the machine and the mechanical definition of life, which biology is doing in so. Okay. First of all, well, the thing I would like to say uh, about art is that already for me, this rejection of genetics because of the code and of the rigidity is suspicious per se. Mm -hmm. I don't see why we should reject. Let's, <coughs> let's admit that we're still in this genetical e era. It has changed, but I will come to that in a moment. I don't see why. The definition of the living being as a code and as a program is bad or insufficient per se. Because you have two ways of approaching this. On the one hand, you can say it is uh, not receivable because it assimilates the living being to a machine. Okay? So this is the first. So okay. this on that point, we can agree and refuse to consider that the living being is an artifact or a machine. But there's another approach to it, which is, and this is very close to Derrida's definitions of definitions of Derrida's definition of writing, that at the origin of the living being there's something like a trace, something which is not so much a code or something rigid, or of course we, we use the metaphor of the, the computer or of cybernetics, but we can also consider this kind of writing as a pure trace that is of something like something which has no origin and no reason. Something like which is perfectly uh, unmotivated and uh, without any substance. You know, I, we, we can on the contrary value this minimal definition of the living being which is absolutely non-essential, non-substantial, and which reduces it to a trace that is to nothing, practically nothing, just a trace 
just a kind of writing with no substantial meaning. So first of all, I think that their critique of genetics is perhaps unfair to the extent that they, according to me, they are not taking, in, taking into account the profoundly deconstructive uh, <coughs> meaning of this definition of the living being. Okay. After all, what would be a best definition of the living being? Okay, so I, I think we can have the double approach, totally contradictory. On the one hand, this is not a good definition because it reduces the living being to any kind of artifact, but on the other hand, I think it would have been fair if some of them, Foucault or Derrida or Agamben, would have asked at some moment, after all, after all, what is their life, what is naked life, if it's not only a trace, that is a writing, that is a series of letters, after all. Okay. So why is this definition a bad one of the genetic code? I'm not, I'm not, uh, persuaded that we have to challenge this definition. For me, it's one of the most productive to the extent that it is absolutely neutral. According to me, to define the living being as a, gene, as a genetic code or as a program is as satisfactory as Heidegger's definition of the human being as a design. Yeah, the genetic code is, for me, the biological transcription in the animal or natural uh, realm of the design, it is of a neutral kind of existence. Okay? I think the best definition of life can only be a neutral one, a minimal one. So I think that we could that we could say many things about this definition of, of genetics. I don't see why we should criticize it. Where is the problem? I don't really see it. Unless, of course, it leads you to assimilate the living being to, I don't know, any kind of, uh, again, artifact. And even though, right, even though, what is the problem? What's so wrong about, about the canonization of life? After all, why should the living being be different from the machine? Where, where is the problem? It is all the most surprising when you see that it comes from deconstructive discourses, which, if you think of what Derrida is doing, for example, he tries to deconstruct right from the start the opposition between the living and the, bee, uh, and, and the machine. Okay. He says this is the most metaphysical of all distinctions, so why, why does it reappear when it comes to the definition of love? So first of all, I don't see what the problem is with genetics. For me, there's no problem. I'm not bothered by, well, the definition of the living being as a program, so what? But, it, it seems, yes? like in a, in a certain sense, even, I mean, programs and machines are, are what are most fragile, they're the things that, of that most easily break down, even more so than, than biological life. Yes, and, um, but we'll come to that in a moment. But for example, if you read Daniel Dennett, he, he talks about the plasticity of the computer. He says we, we cannot understand cybernetics if we, if we still maintain that uh, electronic information is not plastic. So you see, the old opposition, which you still find in Jacob, between uh, the machine and the fragil well, fragility of being between a computer and a plastic instance. This also is being deconstructed now. Okay. Uh, could you write the name also? Is this author? Or Daniel Dennett? Daniel Dennett. Mm -hmm. Double T, which is one. Okay. Obviously. Mm -hmm. No, only one, sorry, yes. Two, sorry. No, two. <laughs> Daniel Dennett is, a, is, a, is an analytic philosopher, okay? So he's the enemy of the people who are reading me. Someone just put it in the enemy of your enemies. The enemy of my enemies? No, the enemies of the enemy. Well, he's a very interesting uh, philosopher who 
precisely worked on computers and cybernetics, etc. And who is uh, really trying hard to erase the frontier between the living being and the machine. And says, he says that uh, uh, if computers were not plastic, we wouldn't be so addicted to them. Which is true. I mean, so, first of all, you know, I want to uh, really um, hmm, question this rigidity of the opposition between machine, the machine and the living being. Why can we find such a thing in the Gambit, for example, or in Derrida, which is quite contradictory to their general uh, philosophy, which is, a philosophy, which is a deconstruction of oppositions, and particularly of this one. If Derrida is deconstructing something, it is precisely this. The, uh, the difference between a machine and a living being. It says this belongs to metaphysics. But the problem, uh, besides this, is that anyway, mm, current bi biology is precisely the site, the very site, where the gradual and definitive giving up of the notion of program is occurring today. Okay. This notion of genetic code or genetic program is purely and simply disappearing from the realm of biology. Okay. So biology said, let's abandon even the notion of a genetic program. So we are entering a new era of biology in which genetics is losing its mastery uh, over say, the living being. And this started when? In 2003, you know that they just, well, were able to decode the genetic of the human genome. Okay? And at that time, when they were able to sequence the human genome, so it was in 2003, they thought that the scientific, well, the scientists thought that they would be able to show that everything in human life was coded and that, that there was a gene for every function. And on the contrary, they discovered that genetically coded part of our organism were just one third of what they thought. And that in the living being, we have vast regions which are called deserts, genetic deserts, which means that they are, not, they are coded by no DNA at all. So in fact, the, the discovery of the, of the human genome, the sequencing of the human genome, was from a certain point of view totally disappointing to the extent that instead of discovering the power of the gene, that everything was coded, everything was done, uh, we only contrary discovered that the genetic program is only a, a little part of, let's say, the, inf well, the information at the origin of the human being. Okay, so there's a book that you uh, can read, which is, I think, very important, which summarizes all the recent discoveries. Uh, it's the book by these two women, Shablonska and Lang. So, which is called Evolution in Four Dimensions. Dimensions. Okay. Evolution in Four Dimensions, which is published with MIT, in which they, they show that uh, genetics has become more and more complex, and that this idea of defining uh, the living being by just the genetic code is really unf insufficient because uh, the living being has several dimensions, and they explain uh, what these dimensions are. Okay. In fact, what uh, Jacob says about the impossibility to interpret the text of the code. This is precisely what appears, appears to be wrong today, appears to be obsolete. Because with the sequencing of the genome, 
in the result of the sequencing of the genome, a new field appeared in biology, a new discipline in molecular biology, which is called epigenetics. So epigenetics is the name of science. It's a part of genetics. But it, it is a specific science, so epigenetics is a name, a substantive for a new science. And you have also the adjective epigenetic, okay, which means, which refers to epigenetics. What is the object of epigenetics? And now it is a science which has known a dramatic development and which is now uh, very important. Epigenetics, very simply, is a science which studies the relationship between genes, that is, the DNA code, and what we call the phenotype that they steer. That is, in order to have a living being, you have the genetic code and then the expression of the genes, which transforms the code into a particular living being, an individual, you or, an, or I, which is called a phenotype. A phenotype means an individual. Okay? So you have the distinction between the genotype and the phenotype. The genotype is the DNA, and the phenotype is the individual. Okay? Between, between them, we have the expression of the genes. There is a transformation of the code into an individual. This term, epigenetics, designates all the mechanisms that control precisely gene expression. Sorry, I have a question. What was the, the definition of the relationship between genes and the phenotype? The genes is the general DNA code, okay, which is present in all your cells. <coughs> and the phenotype is your individual appearance and structure. <coughs> what explain that you have this and this only appearance and stru individual structure. Okay? According to Jacob, if we come back to the definition, the, well, the formation of the phenotype from the genotype was itself a mechanical process, a mechanical transformation. It was another, well, it was the formation of another code from the first one. Epigenetics, on the contrary, discovers that between, or it studies the operations, like the mechanisms, as I said, that control gene expression, that is that between the genotype and the phenotype, there is a series of operations which can be compared with an interpretation, which Jacob was negated. Okay. Right? That is, that there are some mechanisms that transform the code, okay? What, that, what does that mean? It means that between the code and the formation of the phenotype, there are mechanisms which introduce a kind of plasticity precisely of the code because these mechanisms are interpretation mechanisms. So I will take some examples. There are several, well, the scientists were confronted recently with several discoveries which show that in fact the passage from the genotype to the phenotype was a plastic one, in including interpretation and mechanism. First of all, the first discovery, the first discovery was the discovery of stem cells. I don't know if you've heard about. And this is very recent. Stem cells were discovered like in the, well, the end of the 90s. So I think it's very recent. In all, 
organs. In all organs of the body, we have these cells, which are not differentiated, which are neutral. These cells have the capacity to transform themselves in any kind of specialized cells, which means that they are not coded. So first of all, uh, the scientists discovered that some elements present in all organs, some cells, were not coded and were able to transform themselves in any kind of specialized cells. Now these cells are used to repair damaged tissues because they are able to transform themselves in any kind of cells. So they are used, for example, uh, for burn, uh, to, to reconstitute the, the skin, they are used to reconstitute the liver, that, and we hope that they can be used to reconstitute the brain. Okay, so we have a, a potential of self-replacement in the body, and this potential is not coded. Okay? So first of all, epigenetics deals with these cells, study, studies how these cells are able to transform themselves in any kind of cells but which are not coded. So first of all, you know, the passage from the genotype to the phenotype has to take this kind of potential into account. We have like this kind of reservation of uh, this potential, this resource of undifferentiated difference. And this was not uh, known at the time of the, uh, uh, at, let's say, in the genetic era. So first of all, uh, the discovery of stem cells. The second <coughs> discovery, which was very important for them, for the scientists, is the discovery of what they call interfering RNA, Which, what is the interpretation process I was talking about between the genotype and the phenotype? How does that work? You have like a series of membranes, uh, uh, well, let's call that very simple this way, and then the phenotype. So how does that work? How do you, how is the, uh, how does you get an individual from the code? It works because there are a series of mechanisms that either for certain genes to speak, they say, and other are inhibited. So it's a, like a double process of silencing and making speak. You know, you, there's an inhibition of certain letters, and on the contrary, an insistence on others. And this kind of typing, if you want, uh, from the letters, this kind of interpolation is made possible out of another kind of mo well, molecule series, which is the RNA and not the DNA, which inhibits certain genes and favors some others. Okay, so this is RNA in general, but there's a very special kind of RNA which is called an interfering RNA, which is a special dimension of the RNA, which has a specific function, which is to deprogram the gene sequence. Right? So, a certain function of the RNA, which is the interpretation molecule, uh, the interpretation molecular principle, okay, which helps the DNA to become a phenotype. In this general molecular uh, operation, which is the operation of the, of the RNA. You have a specific function of the RNA, which is called the deprogramming function, and you've heard of that because genic therapy, I'm sure you've heard of that, <coughs> therapogenic, genic therapy is founded on the use of this interfering RNA. Okay? So it, it, it is deprogramming a gene sequencing that can be, then be reprogrammed in a different way. 
So if you manipulate the RNA, you can hope that you can silence, for example, uh, cancer genes or genetic diseases genes. Okay? You, can, you can operate directly on the genome in order to deprogram certain sequence, certain sequences. Okay? So we have uh, indifferentiated cells. We have now the possibility of deep differentiation. We have indifferentiation with the stem cells and deep differentiation with uh, the interfering RNA. You can silence, deprogram a genetic uh, sequence. So does that actually change the underlying code or just its expression? No, it doesn't change. So the, 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 the genetic code, the, the DNA remains unchangeable per se, okay? But it, changed, it changes its expression by silencing, inhibiting, or on the contrary making speed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the, the, term, the term epigenetics, epi here means surface. So it's a change, as they call it, it's a change of the surface of the DNA, which means uh, a change in the expression of the DNA. Not in the order of the DNA itself, but in its expression. But in a way, it, it well, it's not doesn't really amount to the same. But it is. We are very far from what Jacob says that it is unchangeable. Um, that you cannot introduce any difference in it. Okay? So. Epigenetics, this science, will study all these processes of, uh, let's say, modification, change, which don't alter the general series of, of, the, of the code, of the DNA, but we, which, op, well, which operates at the level of interpretation, okay? silencing inhibiting. And, as I said, some, some, uh, a certain kind of RNA, interfering RNA is very strong and has the possibility of deprogramming a series. Okay. I have a question. So the, the RNA exists within the DNA? Yes. Not exactly. Well, not <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. Let's say both don't exist. Well. It's only for either DNA. It's, it's like a, in a, if I can use an analogy, a little bit like mediator between mm -hmm. making one DNA molecule into another to co in the copying process is kind of yes it's a, it's a, an unfaithful copy in a way but it, it's just a translation it, it, it is it's actually a faithful copy it's just a different language like it, it, it says it's like saying from English to French back to English again yeah. uh -huh. or something it, it's something different but it is intimately connected with um, the replication. Of yes, the so, so it, it is not exactly existing in the DNA, but at the same time, it is what they call a synthesis. It is a synthesis, synthesis of, of it. So, well, it's, it's a series of operations, you know, it's like. But it's intermingled with it. Yeah, yeah. It only exists sometimes. It doesn't always exist. It, it, it comes into being when it's needed. Kind of. of the genotype is present every time. Okay? But what, what is interesting is this potential, what was considered at the time of Jacob, what was considered like a new mechanical procedure, is like the passage from the genotype to the phenotype, it's just another recoding of the code, let's say. Now it appears as something much more complex to the extent that uh, the, the processes of interpretation appear as really able to introduce differences not in the DNA itself, but in its expression. So it is true that we're hoping, well, the scientists are hoping to be able uh, to produce self-replacement, total self-replacement uh, with stem cells. 
and to be able to deprogram certain uh, serious diseases like cancers and genetic diseases, like I said, uh, using uh, intervening on the interfering DNA, uh, RNA. And the third uh, result, which is very important for uh, epigenetics, uh, concerns neurobiology and is related to neuroplasticity, and this is the one which interests me. Of course, you know, the metaphor of the brain as a computer is very vivid. You find it very often. It started with Bergson. You know, Bergson is comparing the, uh, the brain with the central. Uh, you know, the, uh, a long time ago, uh, there was something called that in English. These, you couldn't call somebody directly on the phone. You had to. It's called a switchboard. And Bergson says this is what the brain is: the switchboard, information coming uh, from there and then going out. Uh, and the brain is this switchboard. So it was the first mechanical metaphor of the brain, and then you have the computer. And of course, we often think that uh, the development of the brain is entirely genetically uh, de determined. Program. In fact, now we know that the development of the neural architecture is for a great part a non-genetic development. Okay. What is genetically determined in the brain is the anatomy of the brain. This is coded in the DNA. It means that the visual cortex is situated here, you know, the locations of di the different regions of the brain are genetically determined. There's no uh, interpretation. There's no um, uh, plasticity in that. Okay, so you, you have the general at anatomy of the brain, which is genetically determined. But what is not genetically determined is the innumerable <coughs> synaptic connecting possibilities. So we, 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 uh, we are born with billions of, well, possibilities of billions of connections, neural connections, you know, that the neurons are connected <coughs> in the synapses, okay, and that all lifelong, our connections are developing, okay, so the life of the brain is the increasing number of connections, of the connections. These connecting possibilities are not genetically determined. So, how does that work? It depends, well, the development of the connections depends, first of all, upon precocious nervous activity in, in the young ch child, but then it depends upon contacts that the organism has established with its environment. That is that experience and learning act as epigenetic factors. And the development of our brain is for the most part due to epigenetic and non-genetic factors, that is, the relationship with experience, learning, habits, environment. So what Jacob said, you remember that the code is inaccessible to acquired experience, is now becoming obsolete because we know that acquired experience is an epigenetic factor for the develop for brain development. Okay? So there is something in the brain like a genetic envelope. The French neurologist Georges calls, calls that the genetic envelope that once again determines the brain architecture and anatomy. But this genetic envelope is just a little part of the brain activity which depends upon epigenetic potential, which, well, the, the developing of the connections 
are entirely the result of acquired experience. And the development of the brain is never ending. Uh, it lasts the, during the whole life. And this is what uh, neurobiologists call neural plasticity, which is the ability to grow, uh, to develop new connections, but also the ability of neural circuits to undergo changes, changes in function of uh, our activities. You know, so some, some connections will develop themselves when we, when we use them. For example, if you play the piano, some connection will develop long-term poten potentialization. If you don't, these connections will decrease this long-term depression. So the brain is able to change form. It is plastic, which means it, that it sculpts itself. The connections are developing or, on the contrary, decreasing in function uh, due to the influence on, of the environment. Because, so these three phenomena, like uh, stem cells, undifferentiated cells, interfering RNA, the discovery of interfering RNA, and third, the discovery of neural plasticity, that is the life, the development of the brain, which is not a result of genetic factors, but which for a great part depends upon experience, these three phenomena are uh, provoking, are, prov are still provoking uh, the disappearance of the notion of program. Okay? So for example, Changeau says, I won't use this notion of program ever again. Because it is not uh, accurate. Of course, we have the genetic code, but we cannot still we cannot go on saying that the living being is programmed with so many factors, or deprogramming, or changing the expression of the genes, and uh, our brain itself as an epigenetic development for the most part. I will read uh, a passage from a book called the mind and the brain. Although it would be perfectly reasonable to posit that genes determine the brain's connections, just as a wiring diagram determines the connections on a silicon computer chip, that is a mathematical impossibility. As the human genome project drew to a close in the early years of the new millennium, it became clear that humans have something like 35,000 different genes. About half of them seem to be active in the brain, where they are responsible for such tasks as synthesizing a neurotransmitter or a receptor. The brain, remember, has billions of nerve cells, nerve cells that make Altogether, trillions of connections. If each gene acquired an instruction for a particular connection, we would run out of instructions long before our brain reached the sophistication of, oh, the banana slurs. <laughs> we don't have enough genes. You know, this is what he says. We don't have enough genes for the trillions of connections that are formed in the brain. Call it the genetic shortfall too many synapses, too few genes. I think this is very uh, eloquent. Too many synapses, too few genes. Our DNA is simply too paltry to spell out the wiring diagram for the, the human brain. So it is a very, um, it's a very simple book called The Mind and the Brain. You know, you find that in the uh, stations or <laughs> railway stations or in airports. You can buy it in like a newspaper. So I bought it because it, it's a, like a vulgarization of this brain, well, new brain science data, and it's very interesting. And it, it is ex explaining very simply why the notion of the, uh, the notion of this, well, the importance of the program has to be, has to be, uh, uh, well, we has to adopt a new way of thinking because uh, undoubtedly no something in the human and in the living being in general is not depending upon genes, and the brain is the major example for that, and not only the human brain, but all kinds of brain. Uh, 
because uh, the trillions of connections that are formed in the brain cannot depend upon genes that we have. Too few genes, too many synapses, too few genes. So we have to explain these millions of synapses by other factors which are epigenetic. Okay, which depends upon environment, experience, learning, <coughs> environment in general, history, conditions of life. Okay? Something which at the time of Jacob, Jacob was absolutely excluded from the realm of biology. And he says also, well, there are several authors, they say a little bit further, the brain is more than a reflection of our genes. So it means that plasticity, which genetic, epigenetics is working on, neural plasticity, there's this ability to form new connections uh, depending on, upon environmental factors, it means that plasticity is in a way programmed to operate without a program. Okay? So the brain is in a way programmed to act uh, without any program. Plasticity means then the absence of determinism, of schedule, uh, design, pre-schematization. Okay, so if we summarize, we have then indifferentiation in stem cell, we have de-differentiation with interfering RNA, and we have self-transformation with plasticity. Okay, so we have these three very important notion that comes to, that came recently to the forefront. Indifferentiation, de-differentiation or deprogramming, and self-transformation, which is plasticity. And now, if, if we want to have a definition of uh, epigenetics, uh, Precisely, we will have a definition which is absolutely contradictory with the one Jacob was uh, giving us of the genome. I will borrow it from somebody who's very interesting, who's the uh, Austrian epigenetic, epigenetician, which is who's called Thomas. You, you can Google him. There's a website which is called Epigenetic Something. Genuine. He's working in Vienna in this uh, laboratory of epigenetics. And he says the difference between genetics and epigenetics can probably be compared to the difference between writing and reading a book. So you see the metaphor of interpretation. Is now very important. Once a book is written, the text, that is the genes or DNA stored information, will be the same in all the copies distributed to the interested audience. So we have one text, okay, in the beginning, one score. However, each individual reader of a given book may interpret the story slightly differently with varying emotions and, project and projections as they continue to unfold the chapters. In a very similar manner, epigenetics would allow different interpretations of a fixed template, the book or genetic code, and result in different re readouts dependent upon the variable conditions under which this template is interpreted. Okay. So Thomas Genevine, Vienna, Austria, Max Planck Institute of Immunology. So go go to the to Google him, and you will discover a fascinating universe that there are different epigenetic well yeah epigenetic society for epigenetics because it, it is still it is still a fight it is still a political fight because most geneticians don't want to acknowledge the importance of epigenetics and still maintain that genetics is 
uh, well, let's say the, the, the main point in biology. Many biologists say, no, 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 the living being is programmed and there's only one reality in genetics, which is the genetic code. And on the other side, you have like the people like Genevieve who affirm that epigenetics is uh, something extremely important and is perhaps more important than, than genetics itself. So at this point, what I want to keep in mind is precisely the coming to the forefront of something which Jacob was criticizing and declaring impossible, which is the interpretation. So we have a book or a score, or the musical, also the musical metaphor is sometimes present in, in Genova. You have a similar text, and from that template, you have different possible interpretations. And this is what epigenetics is about. And it's true that, uh, coming back to the brain, every brain is different. Uh, uh, the form of every individual brain is different. There is no such thing as two similar brains in the world. So it means that the form of uh, the brain is each time different <coughs> because the interpretation is every time different. different. So, as I said, first of all, I, um, I didn't really see the problem with uh, the definition of a living being as a code, as I said so much. Um, after all, why not defining the living being as a code that is as a trace? But now, we don't even have to, to uh, address this question to the extent that the living being is clearly something else than a pure coded being, and that it is an interpretation. Okay? So if we focus on epigenetics and what this means, if we try to uh, produce a philosophical interpretation of that, what does that mean? It means that if epigenetics act, epigenetic factors, act are as hermeneutical or interpreting factors of the code. It means that epigenetics studies the way in which something like a symbolization is produced out of uh, the pure code, that is out of the absence of meaning. Okay? So the plasticity of the living being can be compared with an activity of conferring a certain meaning to it, that is a certain form which is unique, <coughs> it treats it as an interpretation, which means that here the transformation of a code into a, an individual interpretation is an act of symbolization which functions without life and not outside. So it means that if life can transform itself, interpret itself due to epigenetic factors, it, it then means that an activity of symbolization is at work right from the beginning in the living structure. Okay, so we don't have to look for a symbolization which would come from outside, which would be something different from material life. which would be, you remember yesterday we started by defining uh, uh, symbolic life as spiritual life, the life of the spirit. And very clearly, uh, for most philosophers, symbolic life is spiritual. It, it is not rooted within the materiality of life. It seems on the contrary that there is a space of symbolization open within life itself to the extent that the, that the program is nothing, cannot function without its interpretation. This is what the discovery of epigenetics is revealing us. 
to the same extent the brain is certainly not functioning as a computer, at least as, well, according to the old model of the computer, as something rigid is set up. The brain is producing itself. It means it transforms itself. It produces its own form. It sculpts itself. It is plastic. Which means, here again, that the brain is producing its own transformation into a symbolic organ. Symbolization is an activity which is inherent to life and which is not exterior to it. Or if we want to put that in another form, you remember that uh, Agamemnon said, we have to produce the bios of our zoe, but we don't have to produce it because it is exactly what epigenetic factors do. What are they doing? They produce the bios of their zoe. Right? They produce out of a out of a natural given code. Let's call that zoe. Right? Let's call the genetic code the very uh, primitive material of life, the, the very basic definition of life, a code. And let's call that a zoe, because after all, why not? Again, why not? Because all living beings share the same thing. And if we talk about, if we speak of a code, it means that we, we, we refuse to introduce any differences between human life, animal life, vegetal life, or whatever. Okay? So let's say, the, let's define the minimum life, the minimum of zoe, as the genetic code. Then we see that if, if epigenetics or epigenetic factors are absolutely inseparable from this genetic code because there can't be any genetic code without its interpretation by epigenetic factors, then what are they doing, if we want to speak the philosophical language, what are they doing? They're pre precisely producing a form of life out of this, uh, of this zoe, of this minimum minimal factor. You understand what I mean? They are producing, for example, if we go back to the brain, we all have the same brain in a way. If we consider <coughs> the anatomy, there's a, a general pattern, which is, let's say, the zoe of the brain, which is the minimal definition of the living structure of the brain, genetic structure. But this cannot be sufficient to define what a brain is. This is just a part of it. This is just, a, as I said, a minimum uh, definition of it. There's no brain without the epigenetic transformation of such an anatomy into, let's say, a sculpture. The metaphor of sculpture is very, very much used in neurobiology because of plasticity, which means that every code is transformed into a certain form of living, into a certain style, which is a qualified life. Okay? So for example, if I, have this, if I want to understand what my brain is, I won't be able to distinguish within it what is, what is uh, the part played by genetic and, the one played, and that played by epigenetic. <coughs> Because the brain is both a zoe and the bios of the zoe, the form of a certain style of brain, which is mine. And every organ functions like that. And this is what contemporary biology is about. Yeah? Contemporary biology is producing the deconstruction of this philosophy, philosophical um, assertions, according to which biology is the science of programs and all. So what interests what interest me is that producing uh, the bios of the zoe doesn't make any sense because it is what already happens biologically. Okay? So perhaps we have to duplicate this again, to reinterpret this again in a philosophical way. Okay? We have to act it politically, but it doesn't have any meaning if we don't ref refer it to what happens in biology. Because this is exactly what biology today is teaching us. That what is biology? 
Biology is the science which studies the way in which Zoe produces its own form, that is its own style. So in fact, you know, uh, again in the book you have thresholds, thresholds, you know, many chapters which are called thresholds is the transition from one part to the other. But precisely biology, what, what does it do? It, it works on the thresholds. The passage from passage from the code to uh, its interpretation, the passage from de differentiation to differentiation of the program to deprogramming. Biology is the, sci it is the science of thresholds today. And precisely because it works on the difference between, let's say, the raw material of life, the minimum definition of life, which is a code, which is a trace, okay? The threshold between this minimal, very material definition of life, which is common to all living beings, and the transformation of this minimal, uh, thing into a form of life which is also present in all forms of life because the first discoveries concerning neuroplasticity and I think this is very interesting it was about slugs okay. the first well, the first time when uh, the neurobiologist said that the brain was plastic was after observing the way in which some slugs were developing or not there I don't know how to call that Mantle, swallow in French, under uh, certain well, habits, they were transforming their connections, uh, their body, well, their brain connections, and then producing this plasticity of the brain. So every living being is concerned, even the plants. Epigenetics okay? works also on plants. So that it is for me fascinating because it is the end of the separation between different forms of life, every living being is concerned, is producing the bios of its zoe. It is the law, it is the biological law, so philosophy has nothing to say about that. And this is what fascinates me, is that um, biology has clearly superseded philosophy, clearly. I mean, it has pushed the construction to such a level that for us, we can only run behind it. No. And for some mysterious reason, it is not known. Nobody wants to talk about that. So, of course, if, if you say, oh, but biology is working on, well, it is the Nazi use of genetics. Or it, it is this science which maintained the condition of the homo sacer within uh, contemporary society by producing this coma de passe things and so on. So. Of course, if you limit your definition of biology to this, then of course you can say we need a deconstruction of biology and philosophy has to produce uh, the erasure of the frontier between the symbolic and the material. But this is what I want to say is that this frontier is already erased. Okay. It's already erased by biology. I think this is very clear in the definition of gene line. Very clear. That in, in biology you have the book and you have the interpretation of the book. So you have the material, the raw material, let's say, the score, or the, well, the basis, and you have uh, the mm, personal approach to it, this plasticity of interpretation, what, what is the kind of symbolic approach to the raw material? So, so the frontier is precisely erased in contemporary biology. Yes, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, no, I just want some clarification because I, I guess not. Yes, 
I don't want to be, well, because I want to be as simple as possible, I'm sometimes a bit clumsy because it's difficult to talk about that yeah. in a simple way, not entering into technical details. Uh, epigenetic factors, you have two kinds, right? You have genetic epigenetic factors, that is, program functions of gene expressions, okay? So it depends, these factors uh, are, depend well, are chemical most of the time, okay? So they are program themselves. Okay. okay, so each production of phenotype depends upon genetic, genetically determined epigenetic factors. Okay? But you have a second kind of epigenetic factors and they are both working together, which are environmental factors. Okay? And, then, uh, the and you, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. Okay? Uh, individual phenotype in a program way into the program. So at this level, you, you get, it's very difficult to, but you, you can see at this level that in fact the difference between randomness and necessity erases itself. You see what I mean? At, at this level you can see that the difference between uh, uh, rigid, mechanical, determined processes and, uh, let's say, supple plastic processes, this difference is erasing, okay? Because the interpretation is itself depending upon genetic factors, okay? And if you want to say, okay, so then epigenetics is, is another name for mechanical science, then environment comes into the forefront and no, 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 but epigenetic factors are also environmental factors. So every time we, we try in, in, in contemporary biology, in current biology, every time we, we try to assign biology to one side or the other, let's say it's totally mechanistic or it's totally random or support, the distinction erases and this is what is fascinating. You know, that this, well, that, that's why I said that it went beyond the construction because Derrida is trying so hard to supersede the distinction between the machine and the living being, but it cannot, he cannot do better than biology itself. And this is my problem as a philosopher, it, it is because everything we we're trying to deconstruct is being, well, uh, well. Th this impossibility in which biology puts us to differentiate, to really differentiate between a machine and a living being, between necessity and randomness, so as well. Uh, this is a real philosophical challenge, because what do we do? Okay. What, what is there, what, what remains to be done? But when philosophy says we have to talk about life, we have to put life at the center of our investigation, always prefer life, we have to insist about, uh, on life as a right as well. We have to erase this distinction between the symbolic and the biological. So what do we do? If this is already done, if this is precisely what biology is doing. So I want you to be aware of this ambiguity of biology. Yes, it is true that on the one hand, biology is the science of genetic manipulation, etc. So right. Everything that so, uh, biotechnology is, you know, everything uh, that Agamben is talking about is true in a way. But there's this other side that we cannot forget, okay, which is the epigenetic one, and which is deconstructing the first. Okay. So in fact, the most philosophical of all science today is biology, undoubtedly. Okay. So I don't see why, I, don't, I can't understand why mm, philosophers are still you know, 
using this old, inaccurate vision of biology as, you know, in this, uh, well, what Heidegger says, but in this, uh, I, I, I can't see uh, why. And, and uh, when we use the term interpretation, if so, I mean, we yes, still of course, of course. Sort of fall into this, you know, how, why and, and how. And <coughs> <coughs> well, uh, it is true that it is vague interpretation, but I think also that if Jacob Vine is using this term and Jablonska uh, is using the musical metaphors, as I said, like you have the uh, score and you have the uh, player, piano player, or violin player, so on. Of course, this is vague, but I think they do that in order to, um, in order to contradict very simply, as simply as possible, the traditional vision of biology as a hardwired science. Um, this is very clear. <coughs> If we want to understand uh, what interpretation is, if we want to put that into other terms, it is what introduces differences within sameness. Well, uh, if we have the same score, the same text, Jacobi says, the same book or template, it is what introduces, uh, yes, differences, dis dissimilarities within sameness. Mm. So, in fact, biology is a science of differences. Yes? In a way, interpretation... Oh, and, and I will go, go back to the sovereign. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. No, no, no problem. Yeah. Go in on. a way, interpretation is kind of a loaded term, I think, in this kind of context that we're operating in. And in a certain way, reading Jablonka, the, uh, the musical metaphor, the mm -hmm. metaphor of a score and an interpretation is a, maybe a little more productive if you if one thinks about the notion of timbre, um, because interpretation of a score can vary amongst players, but within uh, kind of musicological framework, timbre is still a completely, really non-understood concept. Uh, like what, the kind of difference that exists within the sameness of a sound wave mm -hmm. and its relationship to a sonic envelope is, I mean, if you look at the specific research into that aspect of musicality and sonorousness, it's it's anybody's bet. It's still a real argument that's happening. So it's a, maybe yes, a yes, little yes. slightly more productive it's metaphor. It's more perceptual as opposed to being more, more perceptual as opposed to being more coded. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So about sovereignty of the brain, um, no, of course, the brain is not only uh, what is located in the head. What Damasio says uh, the brain is the organism. So the notion of or organism now equates the brain. So the brain designates the whole circulation between the brain and the body. So the brain is not only the brain. It is the whole nervous organization. Okay. So of course you have the organ, which still, if you want, has this role of sovereign. But uh, it is more and more mm, discussed and more and more contradicted because uh, when we talk about the brain, and read the master, it's very interesting. In, it shows that um, the brain and the body are one and the same. In fact, that it is the whole system that is. Uh, that we, that is the nervous system, organism, the notion of organism. So you see it's quite different from what we, talk, what we were talking about yesterday. We were talking about organism at some point. Uh, now we know that organism is this whole <coughs> plastic operation of 
forming oneself, in which the, the body, brain and, and the body are forming themselves together. takes in environmental factors mm -hmm. in that processing. Mm -hmm. So what would be the question? Is, I, mean, I mean, does the, the sort of delimination mm -hmm. of the organism start kind of deconstructing as well if environmental factors are part of that processing? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You mean deconstructing the very notion of environment? Or the, the differentiation between the organism and the environment? Yes, of course. Um, this is, this is another fascinating chapter of biology, the redefinition of the organism and uh, the re of the relationship between the organism and its environment. Now, to, to the same extent that we say that the brain is the whole organism and not only the organ, we also say that the organism is organism plus its environment. Right? So the organism is in fact the frontier between the living being and its environment. Mm. Well, so, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with Varela. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's say fifth, uh, about 50 <coughs> years ago, an organism was defined as a closed structure, autopoietic structure, and was compared with uh, some mechanical processes of uh, what well, system, autonomous system, auto, auto produced systems. Okay. So until very recently, and Varela is fascinating also, it's very interesting. I think he was the first one to use the term plasticity within uh, biology. And, but he showed that an organism was plastic to the extent that it was forming itself within a closure, it was a closed system. Now, the definition of the organism has evolved, and an organism is a frontier. It's not so much a closed structure, it is a frontier between the inside and the outside. And again, it's very interesting because the, the, the uh, because uh, inside and outside are disappearing, are being reconstructed. So we we find the old problem of symbolic material, the frontier between both sides. It's well, all that is reshaping, is being reshaped, reformed. For example, you know that we're formed by many other organisms, bacteria, so we don't have only our DNA, we have many other DNAs in us uh, coming from other organisms, bacteria. Okay, So we, you cannot say we have one organism which is closed on itself, we're open, we're at the frontier, we're an interaction, just as the brain is the interaction between itself and the body, our organism is in itself an interaction. With other organisms, colonization, we call that. We are colonized. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Colonized by other organisms. And, uh, okay. So it is this interaction between different structures, which, which is now uh, interactions, interpretations, producing difference, production of differences. This is what biology is working on. So it has nothing to, to do with this uh, caricature of like, Nazi, uh, nothing to do with that. Hmm. Um, yes? Um, uh, what do you think is the, is the implication of this discoveries to the question of uh, subjectivities, uh, because at the beginning when we had the distinction between symbolic uh, bodies and the you know, animal bodies, then we kind of locate subjectivity in, in, in the sim symbolic uh, level, but now it seems the boundary is becoming blurred. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, in, in, um, in the case where we, for example, if we develop um, techniques in in, interve in, in intervention into, for example, the, the uh, interfering RNA, then we kind of have this um, 
would you say that it, it is kind of subjectif subjectifying um, the, the biological process? Or um, how do you locate this problem of subjectivity in, in, the, in this new you know, re uh, realm of... Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. of course. Um, and this is the problem. What is a subject then? Mm -hmm. um, Or should we just give up this question? But <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that, that's why I, that's, that's why I'm trying to you know, bring up this case of you know if you if you have the technique to intervene the, the the mechanism or the organisms, then there's still a subject to me. Maybe yeah. I'm just staying in the, in the old dreams, but anyway, but there's there is a you know um, an autonomy in, into the, the operation. So, um, yeah, but of course you're, you're right, it, it is an essential uh, problem, even if perhaps we have to think beyond subjectivity once and for all. Yeah? But anyway, um, the problem is that plasticity, the shaping, trans well, self-transformation, the production of, of ourselves as um, plastic subjects, okay, is precisely in philosophy what is the very... Uh, operation of history and symbolic life. Okay? If we are able to shape ourselves, if we are able to transform ourselves, to uh, Foucault talks about self stylization, etc., it cannot come from biological factors. Definitely not. Not. Okay? Right? It is our own operation, subjective operation, understood as a production of history a kind of historical transformation. History is, uh, let's say, the major plastic operation. It's plastic surgery. Okay? History, this is what it is. It, it is the possibility that we have to transform, to transform ourselves. We are determined living beings and being historical at the same time give us the possibility to transform this natural life into the, uh, symbolic. So the implications now is that we cannot, and this is also a problem, there's no, it, it seems to be no difference between history and development. And this is a real problem, that what is then the difference between uh, the historical and uh, what pertains to development? We, we, don't talk, we don't speak of evolution anymore. Evolution is accomplished when we talk about development. This development being, for example, brain development, as I just described it. So now we are, uh, th there's another frontier which is disappearing, which is the frontier between history and development. When Marx says we have to become conscious of our own possibility to, to, to build our own history. Okay? You know that Marx texts on history begin like that? We, we're making our own history and we don't know it, so we have to become conscious of it. You are the authors of your own history. We can understand that from a spiritual point of view, that we are the authors of our own history. We are responsible for the production of historical conditions. But what does that mean from a biological point of view? Okay? What if somebody said, you are making your own brain, okay? you are the authors of your own development, so be aware of that. What is, how can we produce a subjectivation of our biological uh, being? So the, the question you're addressing about subjectivity concerns a, a real difficulty, which is how is it possible to have a subjective approach to these non-subjective processes because we cannot produce the awareness of these biological factors. We can explain them, but we cannot really subjectivate them. It is impossible, we can try, but it, it is impossible to feel these uh, processes, to have a subjective, you know. And yet, for me, if you want to know, this is the task. What we are responsible for is to produce a new subjectification of biological processes. We have to find a way of becoming aware, just as Marx said, be aware of the fact that you're producing your own history. 
for me, it is a way of what well, we have to produce a discourse about <coughs> this. We have to find a, a new consciousness, which is the, the awareness of consciousness of our own biological plasticity. I don't know how it is possible, but this, okay? So in fact, your question about subjectivity is very important. It's not so much about what is a subject, because I don't think this is the problem, but how is it possible to subjectively, to, to define uh, the biological being as a subjective, uh, as the essence of subjectivity, as the very basis of subjectivity. Do you have any question before we... Yes. Sorry, uh, just a question. You First you said that we arrived at the end of evolution, if we could develop on that. And the second question is, uh, in this critique of uh, contemporary philosophy through contemporary biology, where does uh, the uh, pragmatists like James and Dewey uh -huh. fit in? Because uh -huh. I know many neuroscientists that venture a bit into philosophy uh, that don't like that. Ah, there's a beautiful text by James, which I adore in Italy, which is called Habit. Mm -hmm. It's a chapter from his book on psychology. Um, it talks about plasticity and the nervous system, etc. So, so sorry, what, what, what was the first question? <laughs> the first was, what do you mean, end of evolution? Ah, yes, end of evolution. Well, it's not my decision. <laughs> it's been, well, the evolution of species has come to an end, it means that uh, uh, we won't be able uh, to see new species coming out from appearing. It seems that the forms of life has, well, cease their, uh, see what I mean? But the fact that we are uh, still losing teeth, changing our anatomy through the years, that's you cannot. A then you cannot precise it. This is what, what is very interesting. The four dimensions of evolution, because this transformation, mm, like losing, etc., et uh, is n you cannot separate the evolution dimension of it from the developmental. But could you before? Yes. Normally, yes. Okay, because because uh, you know that Darwin says that environment. You have to, well, the species have to adapt to, envir to the environment, but they are not transformed by it. You know, that, that, that was this very strong critique of Lamarck. Okay? So all the uh, changes in the species are not due to the environment. It's an internal tendency. Okay? Now, every changes which occur uh, which well, every change which occurs in, for example, the human species is absolutely inseparable from the ecological, developmental, environmental um, condition. I still don't understand what what made the change. Where is the turning point? Well, I think. Um, but it's, it's a very old uh, moment. I think it's, well, uh, it stopped with Homo sapiens. Okay, this is what, what the Baji says. And now we have this new discipline which is called Evo Devo. You, you've heard of that? Mm -hmm. Evolution development? Mm -hmm. So, it's not, well, well, evolution is still a very big topic in science, but we don't call that evolution, we call that Evo Devo. Evolution development. It is impossible to have one without the other. They, they explain that very, very well in their books. In their book, you know, the two. And the other, what it James was how Dewey? James and Dewey fit in this picture of the criticism of philosophy through biology, because they seem to have, in a way or another, uh, foreseen some of the latest biological uh, discoveries. Yeah. Well. I, I think um, we, we cannot enter into details here, but very simply, it, it is very clear that both of them uh, 
said, I've said very, well, uh, very early that um, we were only, we were producing ourselves biologically. Okay? So that every transformation, every habit is not so much the result of historical processes or intellectual or spiritual processes rather than the result of habituation, habits, which is, uh, for James very clearly, cerebral operations. Okay? So James, right from the start, refuses to draw a distinction between history and biology, because for him, human plasticity, human transformation, is a biological process. Well, both biological and, and historical. In a way, it's also evil at, at this level. So this fragment, and pragmatism is very interesting as an attempt of erasing the frontier between um, the uh, uh, symbolic and, and biological. Okay. So let's... Um, 